So I want to take you to a, uh, the zoo in Portland, Oregon. I want you to picture a kindergarten class going to the zoo on a day when the whole rest of the city is there and there's kids running around. And this group of kindergartners are standing there and another class walks by. Another class of young kids walks by and a little boy walks up to his teacher and tugs her on the arm and says, teacher, teacher, do you remember that Olympics thing, those Olympics videos we watched? The teacher looks down at him, at him and says, well, yeah, we've watched four or five by now. What's your point? That little girl that just walked by, she doesn't have a hand. I wonder what sport she does. And you ask yourself, how can a, how, how can a little boy have that kind of perspective? How, how do you gain seeing ability where the rest of us would see disability? Where does that come from? They must have a family member or, or know somebody. And that's what I'm here to talk to you today about. I'm here to talk to you about what we do at Classroom Champions. Uh, and how we've been looking to focus the use of education technology and change it away from this massive open use and actually focus it in so we get that kind of impact and we cause that kind of relationship where we change those mindsets in kids and we get them to understand that there's different people out there and we get them to understand these things. So that's what I'm here to do today. Uh, Classroom Champions connects Olympians and Paralympians with kids across the US, Canada, and Costa Rica and we do it on a regular basis. It's not the classic one in, one out kind of thing. And I want to talk to you about that today, but I want to do it under the premise of a few scenarios that you will be familiar with. Because what I'll tell you is something that's a little bit different and a little bit new. Uh, and that I am really excited about. I, what's been happening in our classrooms the last few years is amazing. Uh, and I'm really happy to be here to share it with you. But I'll talk to you about things that you are familiar with. And one of those things is a classroom full of kids who walks into a school and Sits in, front of the sits in front of the computer and throws their headphones on and, and hops in front of a MOOC, a massive open online course. And these things are amazing, aren't they? Like, I mean, the fact that we can learn from the experts of the world and we can learn things that we wouldn't at all have the possibility of learning sitting in our classrooms, whether it's in Los Angeles or whether it's in Mumbai. Kids can now learn from anybody. But I want to get into where some of the issues are going to run into there that I think we're kind of addressing with Classroom Champions. Second is a story that probably a lot of you in this room actually are familiar with because you probably went through it. A friend of mine, Andres Valenciano, Andres is the executive director of a really awesome organization in Costa Rica called Acción Joven. Uh, and Andres did, again, what possibly a lot of you did is they left their home country and they went somewhere else to go to school. Did anybody else do that? Else go to school away from home soil? So a few of you, a few of you in the room here. All right, it happens fairly often, right? That's the model to get a global education to understand global reach and to gain a global network is you go away. We're going to talk about a little bit of the problems with that, a little bit of the things that I think that we talk about at Classroom Champions. But I want to bring you to something a little more personal for me. As was mentioned, uh, I'm a three-time Olympian. I'm an Olympic gold medalist uh, in the sport of bobsleigh. We're in the Middle East. I don't expect you to know what that is. But bottom line is I ran for five seconds and I sat down for a minute and I was the best in the world at it. But I know how, how long it took me to get there. I know how long of a process it is to do those kind of things. And the scenario is something that we all know. An athlete goes into a school or a mentor or somebody who's prominent and is an expert goes into a school. And as I would go into a school, I'd walk in there and I'd spend an hour with kids and it was great. And I would talk to them and they'd ask me questions. And then as I would leave, I would talk to whoever I was you know, walking out with the principal or something and go, you know, if one or two kids listened, it was worth my time. And I'd give one of these and that I'd never see those kids again. And that's where the issues come up with this kind of scenario. It's a one-time interaction. Lack of follow-up. As an athlete, I have no idea if what I said to those kids actually made a difference in their lives. We have no idea if that's actually impacting them or not. We don't get to see that. We leave and we, and we go away. There's nothing for, the, for the, the person who's coming in to teach. There's nothing for them to get back from it. And it's a huge schedule disruption. I, mean, I go in on my time. What does that have to do with a teacher? They have to mold themselves around what my time is. So that's where we started this thing of called Classroom Champions. And when I say we, uh, I started with my sister. My sister, Lee Parisi, has her uh, PhD in education and social policy. So it is not just an Olympian who's trying to do something. We are trying to do something big. And we're, my sister is helping us on that side actually have this huge education uh, background to it. So as I said, the classic thing that we all know, this person goes in to, to give a talk. What we've done is we flipped that on top of itself using technology and focusing the use of our technology. 
So now the mentor, the Olympian, the Paralympian, we have dozens of them throughout our network. They send a video lesson every month. It's not 10 pre-recorded video lessons. It's something every month they're doing throughout the entire school year. We adopt classrooms for them. So these kids sit in their school and they have their athlete. This is my athlete. This is my Olympian. Somebody believes in them. And the, each athlete then has a handful of classrooms that are involved with them. So the athlete sends a video lesson. We talk about things like goal setting, the things Olympians are great at. Goal setting, perseverance that were just mentioned. Uh, perseverance, steps to success, community service, the things that Olympians are known for, that's what our athletes teach. And they're not just teaching how to set a goal, they're teaching the process to get through that. The students watch and discuss in class on their own teacher's time. The teacher can watch the video ahead of time, can put it in and implement it whenever is convenient for them and have the conversation go around whatever is important to the kids at their level. And then the kids actually get to create something. So we're using technology in a way that's engaging for the kids. We're not just sitting them in front of a computer. They're getting excited. We hear from teachers that you have those kids that are shy. But as soon as you put a video camera in front of them and they're telling their Olympian what their goals are, or telling their Olympian how they persevere this month, all of a sudden their eyes light up and they have something to say because they're telling somebody. And then we supplement it with a couple live video chats every year and sometimes we wind up with some in-person visits. So what we have is a system where we have our mentors that we give them some bumpers, we give them some ideas of how to do things. Uh, we have all of our athletes talking about the same thing every month. Uh, structured support, multiple classrooms, and then they can do it whenever they want. We need to find a way to get our experts of our world, whether it's our Olympians or whether it's other experts in our society, we need to find an efficient way for them to use their time. Not everybody has an hour every month to go into a school or go visit with kids and leave and come back every single month. So we need to find an efficient way to do that, and that's what we've done with their five to 10 minute lessons that they, sh that they shoot from wherever they are at the time. Now, I've heard this mentioned, and my sister would be a so sad that she wasn't able to attend because so many times we've talked about the importance of the teacher. And Bill Clinton talked about that this morning, that the teacher is the most important part of the classroom. And that's the same thing for us. The teacher is our touch point. We don't actually, our athletes don't connect with the kids in the physical way. We don't connect with the kids in the physical way. We connect with the teacher. We give them the resource. We make them the lead person in the network. We provide them with professional development. We give them technology. We're giving tablets and iPads to make sure that they're able to watch videos, record videos, and do things like that with their athletes. And then on the student sides, we're giving them a voice. They're not just being talked at. Facebook, Twitter, those things are out there. They know that. Whether they're on there or not, they're on, they know it. And they want to be able to express themselves to the world. One of our teachers in, outside, of Texas, outside of Houston in, Tex in Texas had talked to me about kids these days, they don't want to put it, they don't want justification from, from people around them. They want to tell the world they want to see how many times something got liked or something got retweeted. That's what gets them excited. And you wind up with things like this, and this is a little bit of a view of what it looks like. Hi, Marilyn Charlie. I'm Jennifer Regards from Seymour, Indiana. Hey class, David Oliver coming to you again. I came to you today talking about nutrition. Community. Setting a goal. Hi, Charlie and Meryl. My name's Carlina, and someday I want to be a chef. A leader listens. <laughs> You guys have been such an inspiration to me, and I can't thank you enough for that. So every month these athletes are sending this, and every month the kids are getting to interact, and they look forward to it every single month, getting to do that. The teacher is the broker of the relationship. And as we move into places away from the U.S. and Canada, and we start facing other things. In the U.S. and Canada, we're looking at goal-setting skills and perseverance and digital literacy. As we start our partnership in Costa Rica, we're partnering with the Olympic Committee and Acción Ven. And we start to look at different issues. And it makes me think about uh, a friend of mine, Mike Flynn, who runs Little Sports in, in Kenya, in Aussie. He had said to me one day, poverty is and isn't the twisted metal of the slum dwelling. It's in the repetitive dysfunctional behavior of the violence. Children who are never exposed to anything better live with every day. And that's what we can do with technology now. We can connect them with people who know better. We can connect them with people who have fought through and failed and persevered and gotten up and failed and persevered and gotten up and then succeeded. And they can see that it's possible. I mean, how many of you here have taught or were teachers? How many of you, keep your hands up, how many of you have worked with adults? All right, how many of you have learned that if you tell somebody something once, they're going to learn it? 
All right. Anybody who raises their hand, I want to talk to you after this, because that's a good trick. So consistency, that's how they learn. It's not the one visit. It's the over and over and over. That's what we've established here. We've been, we found a way to make it possible for the currently competing Olympians. We're not using retired athletes. We're using people who are going. We had 15 athletes in the Olympic Games in Sochi. We had two athletes win a Paralympic gold medal just yesterday in, in Sochi in sled hockey. These athletes are still competing, but we found an official way for them to do it. So consistency, we found somebody the kids can respect and the teachers can respect as well. They build a relationship, but most important, it's teacher-led. The teacher holds that relationship, which brings us to one of the stories I told at the beginning. Kids using MOOCs. Now, here's the drawback to some MOOCs. They're 17 to 13 percent completion rate. I know what a lot of you are thinking. That's the higher education a lot of that's being used these days. It's online education. People are starting a course and they're leaving because, you know what, they just wanted a little bit of knowledge. But don't, as an Olympian, don't get me started on the culture that we're breeding and starting something and not finishing it. Uh, but this is seeping down into K-12 in North America now. And it's seeping down into K-12 in the rest of the world. All right? And these are the things we have to keep an eye on as we start to disseminate that kind of technology and that kind of information. And we have a lack of adult interaction with that. All right. Yes, we're learning from an adult on the screen, but we're not physically there with them, and that's going to cause some problems we're going to talk about. And there's no place for a student voice. They're being talked at. There's no place for them to express back. Because here's the thing that we know about kids and adults. Positive adult relationships yield higher levels of psycholo psychological and behavior engagement in school, and they mitigate otherwise significant environmental risk factors. It's a really important statement. When you can find kids and you can give them positive relationships with adults that are role models, good things happen. When you do it with a teacher, they're more engaged in school and they have a decreased likelihood of dropping out of school. Which takes us to a really cool study that was done. It's pretty old research, early 90s, but the, or the, the recent data kind of backs up what this study shows. And it was Jonathan Crane at University of Illinois and what he showed was that when you go from 40 to 50 percent role models, we'll call them high status workers by U.S. Census Bureau, we'll call them role models uh, for the terms of this. These are people with good jobs, earning good incomes, uh, things like that. Uh, when you go from 40 to 50 percent down to 5 or 6 percent, you wind up with a modest gain in dropout rates. But all of a sudden, those neighborhoods that need it the most, we work with low socioeconomic, low access, uh, aboriginal neighborhoods and aboriginal communities in North America, this happens. So those last couple role models in a community make all the difference in the world. So if we can utilize technology to actually bring those role models in and find a way for them to have that relationship and kids get excited and kids actually understand that this person believes in me, maybe we can do that. Maybe that's one of the best things technology can do is by bringing in relationships into our schools. All right, a great example is a woman named Haley Wickenheiser. <laughs> Again, as we sit in Dubai, at no point, just like Bob said, at no point do I expect most of the people in the room to realize that Haley is one of the most famous athletes in, the, in Canada. Haley is five-time Olympian, uh, four-time Olympic gold medalist. Uh, she, sits, she just got elected to the Athlete Commission of the IOC, and she carried the flag for Canada last month in Sochi. All right, she's one of our athlete mentors. Here's what kids said after having a live video chat with Haley. They had a Google Hangout with Haley when she was off training. Uh, and I want to just bring in a clip. Careful, listen carefully to what they're about to say. Learn more information about Haley. And to meet face to face with her and let her answer our questions. Listening to her answer our questions. Isn't that awesome? Do you hear what that little girl said? What did she say? Face to face. Because for them, this, that's face-to-face. -face. She didn't have to qualify it. We would qualify, right? It would be a caveat. We would say, uh, we, we, ch we had a meeting today face-to-face -face via Google Hangout or via Skype. Not for them. That's real life. Right? So, and I'm not here to say whether it's right or wrong. I'm not here to say whether they should be texting or talking to each other in a conversation. I'm not here to have that conversation. I'm here to say that's what they want. That's what they believe. So why wouldn't we just harness it? and wrap it up and, and do something with it. Right. And because of those relationships, these are the kind of things that we see. We see improved goal setting ability, perseverance skills are up, digital literacy is up. Teachers are telling us that their classroom culture 
every 100% of our teachers tell us that it has increased their classroom culture to have this kind of relationship and this kind of thing because what happens is the monthly lessons come in, but the teachers utilize them every day. We have a test tomorrow. What would Haley do? Haley would go home and study before she went out and played because they're role modeling. They seem that's how role modeling works. We've seen student engagements increase, perseverance, goal setting. So the teachers are telling us the same thing that the metrics of what we're measuring the students are telling us, which if you know anything about measurement, that's really good when things like that line up. So to move on to our last story that we know, and this is, this is the classic how you gain a global education. You go someplace, you experience culture. I love this model. I would have loved, I was a track athlete at the University of Florida. I wasn't allowed to go on semester abroad. I wasn't allowed to go do those things. I always had to train. But Andres went home and went up to Costa Rica. Or sorry, he went up to the US from Costa Rica. But when we talk about this, you know why he went? He went to gain a global network. He went to have an understanding of how those things work. And he went to actually bring that information back home. He wanted to have a local impact. Right? So he went all the way to the US to do that. And the, back, you know, the, the downfall is he came from a middle class family. The edu global education crisis, are we talking about middle class families that are having this issue? Generally not. Finan he got financial support from his mother. Now, this, this is a scalable model. No, we know that. So we need to use technology. We need to be able to bring the world to the kids, and we need to do it through the eyes of people that they trust, not through this one person that happens to do it, not through these days, not even through a textbook. You need to do it through the eyes of somebody they trust, and that's what we've been able to do. I am an Olympic swimmer, and I'm from Zimbabwe. Right now, I'm in Germany. Zenal, Switzerland. Black Sea in Sochi, Russia. Oberhof, Germany. Park City, Utah again. London, England. Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. Katerberg. Beijing, China. And that's one of the things. There's so many great things about Olympians, and there's so many great things about athletes. But what's awesome is they go everywhere. Those are just some winter athletes, and there's a summer athlete here as well, who's one of the most famous athletes in Zimbabwe who did a guest video for us. Um, but that's the beautiful thing about, about athletes and Olympians and utilizing them. First of all, it's something that kids can see. If kids can see it, they believe it. So when you talk about failing as an athlete, kids can see that physically happening, and they can conceptualize it, and they can actually understand what's happening. But on the second side, these athletes go everywhere. So since they're able to record their video lessons, we give them a few week window. Uh, you know, the month before their lesson is due to us. Uh, we give them a few week window and they're able to do it from wherever they are. And second of all, that global network that Andres talked about. These are, are either our classroom locations or where we're planning to expand in the next year or two within North America and Costa Rica. All of our teachers are on a global network together. All of them share lesson plans, all of them communicate. They have monthly WebExes together that are teacher led. We have teachers engaged with each other, or we don't even have to lead that conversation. So to bring it all together, Classroom Champions, we believe that if you can put teachers together in an environment where they can collaborate and you give them professional development that's quality, that's relatable to what the information you're going to give them, you get teachers excited. And if you get teachers excited, you get kids excited. And if you get kids excited and you put technology in their hands and give them a reason to use it, a reason to communicate with the world. And then at the same time, you give them an identity that they can share, and you put them in touch with something that is bigger than them. You give them tokens, or you give them something that symbolizes together that there's kids in Toronto, and there's kids in Atlanta, and there's kids in Costa Rica that are part of this same thing that, so, that they are as well. And then you allow them to connect with each other. You've got a classroom in Calgary, Alberta, and a classroom in Indiana chatting together, and up here you've got an athlete who just won her Olympi or Olympic bronze medal in Luge, Google, doing a Google Hangout with about eight classrooms from Sochi. And you're able to wrap all those things together and then things really happen. Once you engage kids at that level and teachers at that level, then things happen. It takes a process. It's a relationship building. But once that happens, this says we set goals in Waller, Texas. They're setting goals together. This is, these are kids wanting to put up, they had their teacher put up on YouTube how they take care of themselves because that was the monthly lesson that their, teach, that their athlete taught them. Kids not only start to understand the concept of perseverance, but they can tell you what those words mean. 
And then lastly, to bring technology back home and have that local impact. Here's a classroom in Atlanta who decided for their community month that they were gonna help their athlete raise money to impact schools in Rwanda. And at the same time, the next day, they went into their local food shelter to give back. That's what we want to do at Classroom Champions. We want to connect kids, we want to connect teachers, and we want to give them a reason to be excited about the world around them and connect them to people who can. We don't have to teach kids how to dream big. They already dream big. Kids want to be astronauts. They want to be, these, they want to be professional soccer players. We don't need to teach kids how to dream big. We need to teach kids how to get there. And that's what we want to do at Classroom Champions. And that's why I'm excited to be here today to grow our global network. So thank you so much for your time and having me here. Steve, thank you very much. I think that uh, one thing we need your help to say to all of these teachers, they are all gold medalists because to take care of kids and to spend you know, their energy and the same kind of passion than you, it's very important. We have time Number for one. some questions. Thanks. Great, great presentation. Thank you. Um, so I have a question. The technology makes us scalable, right? Which is part of what's interesting is that the athletes can be anywhere. They can talk to um, different people. But the personalization of the message to the students means that they're, um, it, it can't be too broad. So how do you balance that? And where, what's the right model for that? We're, we're, we're in the process of right now, it's funny you asked that. We're, I had this conversation yesterday with somebody. We're in the process of trying to figure out what that number is. Kids, aren't, kids are not dumb. Kids know whether they're being talked to or whether it's a massive broadcast. So we want to keep that number intimate. Uh, it's scalable as we grow and gain more, whether they're Olympians, Paralympians, or other athletes. Uh, that's how it's scalable. Um, we have, I mean, to say how it gets personalized is the athletes actually, we give them the list of their teachers' names, and they say those names. I mean, you think about how powerful, you know, Mr. if you're in Mr. Little's class, that your day revolves around that, Mr. Little class, Mr. Little's class going here and there. Um, so right now we're... We're moving up to about 10 classrooms per athlete. Uh, that's where we feel right now, it still feels right to the teachers and the kids that it's still to them. Uh, you know, if you get up to 50 or 100, I think you wind up losing uh, their engagement at that point. So yeah, we're, we're three or four years, we're four years old at this point. So we're trying to still figure out where our breaking point is uh, for that. I think he's got right back here and then. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. Just in terms of, on a similar sort of vein of that question, in terms of scalability, uh, you, you spoke about Olympians. What I suppose I'm asking is how aspirational do the athletes have to be for the students? How far away, how far in front? What are they actually looking up to? In, in, what, in what way, sorry? So, I mean, do, I suppose what I'm saying is do they, do they, are they only Olympians or can they be state representatives? Can they simply be local representatives? I, yeah, it's, um, you know, right, right now... I think it's going to be, what, <laughs> number one, I think what we've learned is that with kids, if you're on YouTube, you're famous. That's, I learned that with kids now. So, uh, but we've seen, I use Haley as an example. Haley is the cream of the crop, the top, one of the best women's hockey players of all time. We see actually just as, just as good, if not better learning for the Olympians that nobody had heard of before they became a classroom champions athlete mentor. And those kids certainly, you know, we've got, uh, from ice dancers in New York, ice dancers uh, mentoring kids just out, you know just in Washington Heights, coast of Harlem in New York City, who they did not know them before. Um, I think it's going to come down to, I think national level. I think something that kids can be excited about. Where that breaking point is, we're not sure, and I think we're going to keep playing with it and finding it. Good question though, because that's good. That that kind of thing would really increase our scalability to be able to to dip even further. So the next question is. Uh uh, financially, how, what's your financial model? How, do you, uh, how sustainable are you financially? Yeah, uh, right now and as we're growing, uh, we have a lot of corporate support. Did you think about introducing games? To do you think about using games? Yeah. Uh, so we're a nonprofit organization. Um, so our funding, right now, we, our funding comes from uh, corporate donors. Uh, one thing that we can do is all of these interactions are recordable. Uh, they're sending video lessons, so it's things that we can share with our sponsors, and they can talk about uh, they can talk about how they're impacting their communities. Uh, so that's that's been our, our impact model, our funding model, right there. As we grow, then I think that's when we start looking at foundations and others. Um, yeah, it's been so far so good as we've been growing. You can give your business card to him. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. 
Uh, great talk, Steve. Um, so how do you frame that idea of the champion to the students? Because I imagine there is some, some disconnection sometimes between an athlete at first for, you know, the, for the, like the woman's hockey player who's, who's amazing seven-time Olympian, and maybe some of the students don't recognize that. Um, to the gentleman's point, it seems very scalable that you could open it up to yeah. any type of athlete then. You know, the, we started with Olympians A because that was my network. Um, that's where I came from. Uh, you know, my sister and I, I was doing, uh, we started Class of Champions because I was living this life that the 10-year-old kid in us would have dreamt of. Uh, I was going into my third Olympic Games. Uh, you know, I was, my friends were Olympians. My friends were Olympic medalists. So that's what drew us to, to that kind of thing. Um, you know, I think what we've learned is that if you can show kids that you care and you show kids that you can believe in them and you can give them something that they can actually be action, you know, actionable advice, which is our athletes give challenges, then you wind up getting, you, you hook kids like that. The Olympics are powerful because whether you want to be a chef, like the video, or whether you want to be a teacher, or whether you want to be, I wouldn't wish this on anybody, but a bobsledder, uh, the Olympics are a powerful thing and it's the most recognizable brand in the world. You put Olympic rings in front of kids in Los Angeles or Mumbai or Sydney or Nairobi and they all know exactly what those five rings mean. So I think that's where the symbolism of the Olympics really takes hold on kids that even aren't sports fans. Um, yeah, great presentation, really, really Thank interesting. You. Um, just a bit of detail, can you give us an example of, uh, say, how the athlete's kicking it off with a class? What are they asking the class to do? What do the class do, and then what do they respond with? And then what's the next video? So, just so we have a, yep, yeah, so, August, so our uh, US and Canada, we run in the September to June school year. Uh, Costa Rica is February to November, but the August video lesson that goes in in August or September gets made is the athlete introducing themselves. We have the athlete, first of all, say hi to the classroom teacher's names that they've been assigned. Uh, we have the athletes talk about things that kids care about. The athletes talk about their favorite foods. They, we, want to make, we want kids to understand the athletes are just like them, and they came from the same spot. So the first video is about introducing themselves talking about the process that they're going to go through this year at Class of Champions, welcoming them back to school, uh, and then asking the kids to, to introduce themselves. So the kids will, will send, you know, the teachers. We, we ask the teachers to make sure that messages are tight. Athletes, the athletes, are, we don't expect them to, to roll through hours and hours of film every of video every month, you know. Uh, the second month, September, we start with goal setting. That's September's thing. And every athlete sets, we don't, I don't want to put those words in the athlete's mouth. They are, the, they are the SMEs, they are the subject matter experts. Uh, if you hop on classroomchampions.org, you'll see athletes creating goal setting pyramids where you know, at the top you want to do this, and then you need to do this, this, and then every day you do this. And then kids, the teachers will, we have lesson plans that get wind up, wind up being shared. Teachers will create lesson plans around the goal setting triangle, and kids will fill those in. They go up on the wall at school and they share those things. So um, then we move on to fair play. We work with the teachers every year. We have April 12th as our annual teacher meeting, and we ask them, did the order of the subjects work? Is it logical? Uh, what are the kids excited about? What are they not? It's a continuously, the athletes and my sister and I will always look to get better. We're always, you know, as an athlete, you watch video, right? Uh, we're always watching video of the program to make sure that we're doing the things we need to and helping the teachers the way that they need to be helped. So. One last question. Yeah, good evening. Uh, the idea of, your idea is phenomenal. And as a, as a student, you. I've never come across something like this ever. And I think if there was something like this during my education, I would be very much inspired to do something different. But uh, a question that I have is, um, you're, you're focusing on international athletes who are Olympians and stuff. So why not focus on national athletes? That is somebody of the ethnic, like somebody who belongs to the same ethnicity as the students, because I'm an Indian. I would be more, much more inspired to know that an Indian who was in the same situation as me has reached there, so I can definitely reach there. Why not start? So no, we absolutely, absolutely, we are in. You know, in right now the the model works. American athletes mentor American students. Canadian athletes mentor Canadian students. Costa Rican athletes mentor Costa Rican students. Uh, in the US, we have quite a spread of demographics, obviously. Uh, we have some athletes who are matched with demographics from where they would have come from. We have some athletes that don't. Uh, we, still, we still get, the, impressively, we still actually get the same results from our metrics, where the same improvements happen in the kids, whether they are. But as we go, Costa Rica is a great example. I was in Costa Rica 
in San Jose in September. And I've given presentations around the world and I've spoken to Fortune 100 executives and I've spoken to kids in different places. I've never been so intimidated as walking into a slum, as a school in the slums in San Jose because I don't know what those kids are going through. I don't know what it's like to cross a river and be, and be afraid that you're either gonna be robbed or raped on your way to school. I don't know that. But the, San, but the Costa Rican athletes who are mentoring them now starting this month, they do. Uh, so to your point, we're, we're there and as we grow, if we were to create an Indian program, the Indian athletes would be mentoring those kids, hands down, and then all the teachers and all the kids are connected that way. So yeah, it's, it's a great point and it's definitely something that we're aware of and making sure we're doing our best to, to match.